So this concept of salience. Salience is our brain's way of deciding what's good and bad. And so drugs and behaviors co-opt our brain's way of helping us survive. Salience is what tells us that a threat is important. So salience, I guess, is in part responsible for when I'm looking for guinea eggs on my property. I love my guineas, so I'm going to tell you about them. Uh, guineas are a, a form of uh, bird um, that uh, look a little bit like road runners with these round bodies and these long heads and these little heads. And there's a reason why they call them bird brained. But they don't lay their eggs in the coop. They free range and they lay their eggs wherever they decide to. And they find a nest and they build it up until a predator gets it or I've taken the eggs out and they figure out I'm stealing their eggs and then they go build another uh, nest. So as I'm going up to the nest and I see this thing, that has colors in it that's kind of wrapped around, salience is that thing that tells me, hmm, looks like a snake. I don't like snakes. Some snakes are bad and makes me turn the other way and go get my husband so he can shoot the snake. <laughs> Rewards such as food and sex have special re relevance. So you know there are certain behaviors that are important to our survival. And I'm going to use you know, an example, which is an old example. So if you think about hunter-gatherers, let's think about the hunters. It's important to have someone tell you about how to hunt and how to use a bow and where to go and what season and all of these kinds of things. And that's part of how we learn. But when you're first learning how to hunt and you go out and you kill your first deer, your brain is going to track exactly where you were standing, where the sun was, how the wind was blowing, how you held your bow. And there's going to be a feeling, and there's going to be high intensity signals that are going on so that that can be imprinted as important. Because all those factors had to do with you successfully shooting a deer getting food, and you and your tribe surviving. What drugs do is you were going along. Someone said, hey, try some of this, and hands you some crack cocaine. And you do some crack cocaine. Well, your brain is like, whoa, dopamine. And the dopamine is so much more intense than the dopamine was for that hunter that just killed that deer or from sex or food or those other natural rewards that you saw. And your brain lays down this memory that says, whoa, if food is good, if sex is good, cocaine, crack cocaine, must be four times as good. And when we bring it back to some of the sayings that we use in treatment, maybe you heard people talk about people, places, and things. Well, not only did your brain have a memory of how the crack cocaine felt, your brain imprinted that memory of where you were, who you were with, what direction the wind was blowing. And when you re-experience that, your brain's going to go back to that dopamine rush that you got. And there may be some sense of priming. So it whets the appetite. It gets the mechanism going. And that is perhaps one way of talking about what is craving. And we talk about craving, and some you know, might say, well, you know, I don't, don't have this experience of an addictive disorder, and I think I like chocolate cake. Yeah, I crave chocolate cake. And, and someone says, you know, they crave cocaine. And we think, oh, that must be like I uh, crave chocolate cake. <laughs> well, <laughs> to the person with a cocaine addiction, chocolate cake is the wave. Cocaine is the tsunami. And if we carry that analogy further and we have this expectation that someone's going to have willpower 
against their craving. It's like saying, you know, I can stand up in the ocean and when the waves come, I can plant my legs and, and I'm okay and I don't hit the sand. And saying to that person with cocaine, well, why don't you just go out there and plant your legs? It's going to be fine. And so they do that. They go out there and they plant their legs and along comes the tsunami and they're washed a mile, you know, onto the shore. And they get up and they're kind of wondering what happened. You know, until we have a way of blocking or toning down the tsunami, what do we do? We tell them to get off the beach. Now, is that 100% successful? Obviously not. So we'd like to have a way in which we could tell them to get off the beach, but we also could turn the volume down or the intensity down on the tsunami. So would that be, uh, would it make a difference genetically when a person, not that they don't do drugs all, but they, maybe they try crack cocaine and they mm -hmm. say, yeah, no, it's just not for me. I tried it and I don't see what the big deal is. Right. So, Something's different there. So the way in which that cocaine either binded to its primary receptor or led to the release of dopamine must be kind of different. We don't know what all those differences are. We do know when you have a cocaine addiction, if we prevent the cocaine from binding, that that seems to help. Unfortunately, we don't have a reliable way to do that with cocaine. We'll talk about some ways in which we try to do that with other substances. So. There's lots of these different tracks, and you can think of them like pathways. If you think of your brain like a meadow, an open field, and there's grass growing up, and you know at first you have this open field and you can walk through it any way you want, and it doesn't seem to matter which way you walk through it. But you walk through it once, and there's a little bit of a path through it. And, but the more you walk through it, the more distinct a path comes. And if you walk through it enough, the path gets really wide. And if you're at that decision-making point of how do I go across this field, well, if you've got this well-traveled path, you're much more likely to go down the well-traveled path than you are to start out new with this grass because it's uncomfortable and kind of hard to find your way. The same is true with addiction. When you've got that well-worn path, it's really hard to decide to go down and then to continue on that path that still has grass on it. So, you know, what strengthens a path? It has to do with your prefrontal cortex, that judgment place, and the ability, how well you've exercised your prefrontal cortex to select one pathway or another. The ability of your prefrontal cortex to extrapolate and say, yeah, I, that really felt good when I did cocaine, but you know what? I lost my job, I lost my relationships, I had a heart attack, it cost me money, etc. So if your prefrontal cortex sends information and it's really well developed, then the behavior that might be expressed is a recovery behavior. But if your prefrontal cortex is not very well developed, some other part of the brain may uh, send the message. And it may be that memory part of the brain that we talked about that said that killing that deer was so good and said that that crack cocaine seemed to be important to our survival. So addiction is potentially just an issue of a learning disorder. We've remembered the wrong thing as being important to our health. And or it is a disorder of that we haven't built up our prefrontal cortex enough to make judgments about what's good and bad. Or it may be a disorder that has to do with, you know, our receptors are so built that once a chemical gets introduced into our body, the neurotransmitters do something very different than they do in other people. One way to look at it is that we have this thing called saliency that tells us you know, that there's a snake in the guinea nest and we should walk the other way, or tells us that um, you know, killing that deer was good for our survival. 
And in the non-addicted uh, brain, the blue part, the control part, the breaks, is very well developed. And so we are able to not go. But in the addicted brain, as you can see, the breaks are non-existent. The memory is larger than life. And the drive to go is just go, go, go. And if you listen to people who have addictive disorders, especially that have relapsed, sometimes really, I mean, they, they just haven't even a clue. They were going down the road. Everything was fine. They'd driven this way before. And suddenly, they made a right turn into the liquor store. Relapses also happen where they're planned days and weeks in advance. But it's not unusual to, for someone to say, it's as though it came out of nowhere. There were no breaks available to them at that time. So what do we do? Well, you know, we have to practice positive behaviors so we have other opportunities for reward. We have to practice good judgment. We have to learn how to weigh, you know, the pros and cons of something. We have to increase the saliency of healthy activity, but also why do we have people write about their consequences associated with addiction? We want to strengthen that thinking, that feeling, that writing, that speaking about the negative, the threat associated with the behavior. And of course, whether we spell it right or not, we want to alleviate underlying psychiatric uh, disorders. <laughs> and that means therapy, it means medications, it means time. Um, Many of you may be familiar with the 12 steps. Some of you may be familiar with the 12 promises. Um, but this here is the 12 rewards. And you say, what is this doing in a talk about the brain? Well, if we look at this, this is all about substitution. So if the brain used to experience desperation, it's finding methods in which the brain can experience hope. If what it used to experience was despair, finding ways for it to experience faith. Instead of fear, courage. One of the activities we do in treatment is a ropes course where people get to work together and face some challenges that on their face don't seem to have anything to do with real life. You know, take one of your peers and manage all together to pass her through a hoop without any part of her body touching the hoop. Um, no, it's not because we want people to learn how to pass people through hoops. It's because we want them to develop the part of their brain that can work together and that can get joy from accomplishing whatever this challenge is. Peace of mind instead of confusion. Self-respect instead of self-contempt. Self-confidence instead of helplessness. The respect of others instead of pity and contempt. A clean conscience instead of a sense of guilt. Real friendship instead of loneliness. A clean pattern of life instead of purposeless existence. The love and understanding of my family instead of their doubts and fears the freedom of a happy life instead of the bondage of addiction. Part of why I would put this up here is when you look at treatment modalities, and we're going to spend the time after the break looking at medications, one of the oldest modalities we have is involvement in peer support 12-step programs. And millions of people have experienced success using that modality. It's not the only modality. It may or may not be the best modality. But if you think about other modalities that we use, whether they be therapy or whether they be medications, there's very few of them that address this broad spectrum of issues that address desperation, fear, helplessness, senses of guilt. So it is one of the few programs available to us that seems to have this kind of broad impact on people's feelings, thoughts, and because feelings and thoughts arise from the brain, broadest impact potentially on the brain. 
Now, we don't have a lot of research about that because the spiritual foundation of the program requires anonymity, and that's really been a barrier to finding out what's going on in the brains of folks that are uh, participating in 12-step programs. And so uh, sometimes you have to take it on faith and experience, and you have to see uh, that it works to say, even I as a scientist can say, I believe in the results, even if I don't have quite as much science. Now, there is science to back it up, but that's another talk. <laughs>